very distinct honor and privilege of mine to be here, and I don't take it lightly. It is with some trepidation and fear that anyone would step and try to even momentarily grasp the wheel and steer what God's been doing. But I feel, I feel good in my spirit because he wants to do something. Just a few moments ago, while wrestling with the Lord, that's what preachers do before they get up. God gave me a couple of things I want to tell you. I want to talk to these kids for just a moment because I, I kind of feel like I really wish I was... I have one regret. If I could start all over, I'd run harder. Listen to me just for a moment. I know we make a, a big deal out of all the deliverances and the ex-drug addicts and the ex-strippers and the ex car thieves and we run the gauntlet of rogues gallery of people. But I want to tell you something. It takes just as much power for God to keep you as it does for him to deliver you. Now listen to me just a moment. I am not against making heroes out of those who've been delivered. But I want to tell some of you something. You may not have come from where some of these have come from. But don't let that be held against you. He said in the book of Jude, unto him that's able to keep you from falling. We all have our own problems and we all have our own difficulties. A man was talking to D.L. Moody one time and he went into this long spiel of, Mr. Moody, I've, I've got this problem and, I've, and this has happened and that's happened and I'm here and I'm this, this is this. And he ended the story by saying, Mr. Moody, what would you do in such a mess? D.L. Moody's quick answer was, Sir, I wouldn't have gotten into such a mess. At some point, we need to recognize that even now that you have been delivered, God wants to begin to keep people. And those of you who are marching into the harvest field and those of you who have children who are raised, you, you, you may not understand who I am and where I came from. But I didn't, I didn't come from the life of a drug addict. I came from the life of a preacher in the home of a preacher. I'm four generations deep in spirit-filled Christendom. My grandmother died past the age of 90. And I was married that she died about 23 years ago. All my growing up years, I remember them having to carry her out of church, drunk, laughing in the spirit. And she's been dead 23 years. My grandfather turned 96 three, four days ago. He retired from pastoring seven times. <laughs> it's hopeless, gentlemen. If it's fire in your bones, it's fire in your bones. I don't think he even knows how many churches he started. He went to missions into Alaska. In fact, the reason my mom and dad got married is he said, either you get married or you're going to Alaska with me because I'm going. And they upped their wedding date so that my mom could stay back with their new husband. My father has oversight of about 750 pastors. His uh, annual camp meetings have 20,000 people in it. I, I, I've been raised in this. I slept underneath the pews before it was carpet under there. And I dodged spike-heeled women while they danced. <laughs> and I have to be telling the truth because I see some old friends out here. I'm not telling you that to say anything except, but God wants to preserve some things now that he has delivered some things. And I... I uh, I may not be the greatest preacher in the world. I don't, I don't know. I'm, in, I'm intimidated to even open my mouth around Michael Brown. And 
I don't have a lot of the different stuff that other people would say, but there's one thing. Nobody, nobody can out-hunger me. And I stand here before you hungrier for him than I've ever been in my life. And I think I've discovered the real secret of that verse that says, deep calls unto deep. If, if your hunger is shallow, your experience is going to be shallow. But if your hunger is deep, then your experience is going to match the depth of your hunger. If all you want is a touch, then that's all you'll get. But if you're, if you're after a, 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 a Damascus Road encounter, a, a, a life changing and altering, then you'll not only have that one, but you'll continue to have those kinds of things. As Paul talked about after that, he, he went from glory to glory and he would get caught up into places. He said, I don't know that I can even talk to you about the things. It, it began at that point. I want to tell you, God wants to, in the words of, of Dr. Brown, mess your life up. And he wants to do it in such a way that, that you'll take your hands off it and let him function. We think we know what we're doing. But in all of, all of my growing up, the one thing I never did is I never let sacred things become common. And to those of you who, who sort of hang around Brownsville, unless you were there when the baby is born, you'll never understand what it takes. And there are always those who crawl from various places and they want to dance around the victory celebration. But victory is really only sweetest to the veteran. And I'm going to challenge you something. I want, I want you to hear what the Word of God, the heart of God is. God wants to create Brownsvilles all over the world. <laughs> Only I don't want to even use that term, and I hesitate to use it, because if we're not careful, we'll hold man's model up for what God's trying to do. We don't really want a Brownsville there. What we want is an, is, is an outbreak of God in whatever city. But if it's Dallas, we want a Dallas. And if it's, if it's uh, Atlanta, we want an Atlanta. Whatever it is, I, I, I have a, a fresh vision in my heart that God wants to break out of the boxes that man has put him in. But you'll, you won't understand what that's like unless you've kind of been somewhere where he has broken out. If you're looking for something, you have to roughly know what it looks like or you won't know how to, how to approach it. And so God has begun to raise up some models and then he's going to begin to, do, to diversify the models. And the greatest mistake you could, do, you could make is to go home and try to copy instead of birth. Cloning is unnatural. Birthing is natural. If you clone something, you're trying to make it exactly like something else. If you birth something, let me tell you what God wants to do. He wants to put a fresh word in your heart, young man, young woman, pastor, whoever you are. He wants to put something in you that will turn you upside down so then he can turn wherever you are upside down. And quit trying to think you know what it looks like because we don't have a clue. We think we know what revival looks like and we hold these various models up. What we, what we know is what the beginning of revival looks like. What God is getting ready to do in the earth and he's going to do it. If he has to abandon us and our man-made structures to do it, He's going to do it. It's not, it's not a matter of will he. It's a matter of where is he. Can I tell you what I sense? The whole earth is pregnant with the purposes of God. The church is, we're, we're swelled up. Our belly is distended. We're, 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 we're like a pregnant woman. 
When a woman is pregnant, you know one thing. You know she's going to have a baby. You don't know where and you don't know when. My mom tells me I was almost born in a five and dime store. Here's what we, we need to sense. We all feel this, this anticipation. How many of you know what I'm talking about? This God's going to have a baby. We don't know where, we don't know when, but something, something's coming that's so much bigger than what we already have that we won't know how to describe it. I was studying today in the book of Ezekiel, and, and I read, read down, and, and Ezekiel was in a real quandary. He, he, had, he had a problem. He had been lifted out. Can you imagine? And I, I don't know what he saw and how he saw it, but can you imagine an Old Testament prophet being plucked out of their environment and plopped into 1999? How would they even have the words to describe what a car was? There was this beast that ate men and went down the road and then would spew them out again and they were okay. And it had two eyes and, you know, their descriptions. And so they would have to use terms from their age to try to describe something from a future dispensation terms from this world to describe something from that world. When you read these Old Testament prophets, you read Ezekiel, and he begins to say, and, and, and it doesn't matter where you start reading in there, I just began to flip through there, and it was one page after another. He said, I saw something, the likeness of this. And he began, everything he described, he had to, he had to try to describe that world using a term from this world and so he would borrow something from this world and attach the word like to it and said it's kind of like this and it's the likeness of that and the closer he got to describing the throne of God the more problems he had with his vocabulary he ran out of words and he finally got to the description and he said, I saw something like the throne of God. How can it be like the throne? It was so undescribable until he was borrowing words. And he said, I saw one like unto the Son of Man. It was very difficult. Can I tell you that what God is getting ready to birth is so much bigger than what we even can imagine that our terminologies are not going to be adequate. So we, we cheapen sometimes what God's trying to do. I have a, a friend who told me this interesting story. His, his uh, uncle, back about 20 years ago when Polish jokes were in vogue and were not politically incorrect, they had a lot of jokes. They called them Polak jokes. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You've, it's okay. We're not going to condemn you. I'm just asking you if you have the information. Well, their name was Gazowski. And he, he grew tired of being the brunt of Polish jokes. And so, and this is, you know, 25 or so years back. So he decided to change his name and, ju and just to preserve some derivative of what Gazowski was, yet shorten it. He changed his name from Gazowski to the word gay. To avoid being made fun of. It was good for a few years. The last I heard, he wished he had never done it. Sometimes we, we take the phraseologies that we have used, and we use this term revival, and we use this, all these various terminologies. But our understanding has so cheapened them until if we're not careful, we wind up racing to a false finish line thinking we've arrived when we just barely got on the track. And we think God is, this is all of God. And I, I don't know how to describe this to you except to say, having come from my background, and I just briefly gave you a, a short synopsis of, of where I've come from. I've been around church for a while. And I, I was in ministry for, for over 20 years. And one day, about three and a half years ago, 
in a service that is very difficult for me to describe to this day. God so showed up. And all I could say is, I didn't know there was this much of you. And I felt all of my vocabulary become inadequate. One of the first things I did is I picked up the phone and called Pastor John Kilpatrick, explained to him, and he said, I know what you mean, but it's like I've been living in one wing of a huge house and had been led to believe that's all there was to it until I stumbled on another door and I walked into a dimension of God and, and there was, it took your breath away. And then what was even more astounding than that is I began to realize that's just one room and there's more. In my father's house are many mansions. It just keeps going. The limitless eternity of God's greatness. He's a, how did you say it in that song? A big O God. It's incredible. His presence is, is overwhelming, but oftentimes what we do is we reach a certain level that we are accustomed to, think that's the, that's the supreme limit, that's as, that's as high as it gets, that's as good as it gets, and then we stop right there. Now with all due respect, and with fear and trepidation, I'm going to say something that may get me banned forever from this pulpit. But if Brownsville is the best God can ever do, we're in trouble. I don't say that with ungratefulness. I don't say that with unthankfulness. I'm thankful for what God's done here. I'm thankful for what he's done in Toronto. I'm thankful for what he's done in Smithton. I'm thankful for what little bit he's done in Baltimore. I'm thankful for what he's done anywhere, everywhere, all the time. But I want to tell you, we do not need to start coasting and thinking we've arrived when God's finally just got us on the track of where he wants to take us. We get we get satisfied with tidbits of God thinking it's, it's all there is. Yes, you've been touched. Yes, yes, people, have, yes, you, you fell down, you shook, you shivered, you spoke, whatever it is that happened to you. But I want to tell you, there is, there is an incredible ability of God. Can, can I tell you that God's biggest problem is he has to dial down his presence to match our expectations. When he stepped up to the, to the tomb that contained Lazarus, his biggest problem was not raising Lazarus. His biggest problem was raising only Lazarus. When he said, Lazarus, come forth, had he not prefaced those words come forth with the personal pronoun Lazarus, every grave in the entirety of the world would have vomited up its occupant. Why? Because there's going to come a day he's going to step to the balcony of heaven and he's just going to say, come forth. And the dead, great and small, are going to be raised. It's not a problem of how much, it's a problem of just that. And interestingly enough, when he rose himself from the grave, if I could use that phraseology, it's like he couldn't get the door shut behind him fast enough and a few slipped out with him and walked through the streets of Jerusalem. God's biggest problem is dialing down his abilities to match our expectations. And that's the real definition of faith. What is it you're expecting? And if your expectations rise, and your expectations only rise as a, in direct proportion to your hunger, and if you're satisfied, listen to me. I'm, I haven't even read my scriptures. But I am sick of church. Just sick to death of it. And, it, and if it bothers 
you, for me to say that, forgive me. But being four generations deep, I literally, my mom called me day before yesterday. And she said, the church that my grandfather had built that, that I grew up in, that I remember where I was filled with the Spirit, I, you know, all those little things. I, I grew up there. I, she tells me that I literally would chew on the hymnal racks because as I was cutting my teeth, it was just the right size. I cut my teeth on the pews at church. And as a gift, when they remodeled that just the other day, they, they cut some of those pews down, and she got two of them, and she said, I've got one for you, and it, it holds heritage to me. But all I'm telling you is I know church. I've been around church. I've been a part of church. I understand church, but I don't like church. I don't like church, I should say, as man has defined it. I'd like to see once in my life before I go on or whatever happens with me, I'd like to see church as God has defined it. And he's probably going to have to repossess the church in order to redefine the church. And I say, go to it, God. It's yours. You bought it. You paid for it. I'm taking my hands off. I want to see what you can do. We've had it long enough. If preaching and sermons were going to save the world, if that's all it took and singing and, and choirs and all the paraphernalia that we've attached to church, if that's what it took to save it, it would have been saved a long time ago. We're missing an ingredient. Or sometimes we've added an ingredient. Sometimes adding an ingredient can be worse than leaving one out. My wife's family, they're from Indiana. I'm from Louisiana. We, we, uh, we would eat rice every day. They ate mashed potatoes. She tells me the story of her cousin that as she was growing up, they... You know, 13, 14-year-old girl learning how to cook. The, the, her job every day was to make the mashed potatoes. And, you know, it gets kind of boring because you peel the potatoes, you boil the potatoes, you smash them up, and that's it. It's done. And she got bored with this, and she saw a bottle of blue food coloring in the pantry. And just to make things interesting that day, she dumped the whole bottle of blue food coloring into the mashed potatoes. So now they have blue mashed potatoes. And the interesting thing about it is normally they cleaned out the bowl of mashed potatoes, but that day there was a lot left. Hardly anybody wanted to eat it. Now, I guess if you grew up eating blue mashed potatoes, then you would say, yeah, it's okay that you should eat it. Can I tell you that the world is desperately hungry for God? But if, all we, if we have so, oh, Lord, help me. If we have so entangled things by adding ingredients of man to the recipe of God until what we present to them, you know what, blue mashed potatoes, there's no naturally occurring food that's blue. And sometimes people are hungry for God and we present the church to them and they say, I want God. This doesn't look right. It doesn't smell right. It smells like man and the the answer is you got to take man out of that and the way man is taken out of that is by repentance less of me and more of him and you hear me if you don't like the repentance message Go find another beach to surf on because what the wave that's coming in is less of man and more of God There's something about God. The things that would repulse us attract him. Every time that, that they would slice the throat of a, a sheep or a goat or a, a heifer and begin to offer that sacrifice, have you ever smelled the smell of burning hair and hide and flesh? It's not so good. It's, it, it's repulsive to us. It has the smell of death on it. But when, when the, the wafting fragrance of that would get towards God in heaven, it would, it would excite him and he would say, That's, I'm, I'm going to go visit with my children. There's going to be a time of visitation now. Why? Because there's death there. Death is what allowed God to approach closer. How 
however much, if I could use this analogy, death was present is how close he could come. Frank Bartleman said, the depth of your repentance will determine the height of your revival. If you don't know who Frank Bartleman was, he was one of the Azusa Street pioneers. The reason this, is, this works this way is because mo we need to take a, a cue card from Moses. You're talking about a man who's, who's seen a lot of stuff, but he's seen just enough to make him hungry for more. And he begins this pounding prayer of, show me your glory. God begins the bargain with him. Moses, I'll, I'll give you rest. No, I, I, I don't want rest. What do you mean with rest? Can I, can I draw some parallels for you? Moses turned his back on rest. Moses turned his back on the promise of, I'll go with you. That, that's a pretty good promise. What, what if you were praying and you said, God, show me your glory. I want to seek your face. And God says, I'll tell you what, I'll go with you wherever you go. What one of us would not want to say, I got a pro wherever I go, God's going. But something in the internal wisdom of Moses says, that's backwards. I don't want God going where I go because I don't know where I'm going. I want to go where he's going. And so he said no to that bargain. I want to see your face. I want to see your glory. And God said, okay, um, I'll give you rest. If there's anything he needed with leading countless Jews through a trackless wilderness with blue age spots on the back of his hands and uprisings, he probably needed rest. But he turned his backs on, re on rest to pursue God's presence. Let me make the New Testament equivalent. In Isaiah, he said, With stammering lips and another tongue will I speak unto my people. This is the rest. We all understand about the rest of the Holy Spirit and how you enter into that rest. And we understand all of that. Can I tell you that there are people who pursue the gifts of the Spirit more than they pursue the giver of the gifts? They have low-level hunger that makes them race to a false finish line. Oh, what are you saying? You're against the gifts? No. But I am going to tell you there's going to come a day when you're going to be faced with a Solomonic dilemma where God says, what do you want? And if you go for the gifts instead of the giver, you'll get the gifts. But that's the, that's the, that's the essence of the parable of the prodigal. He took the father's gifts. He took the finances from the father's home to finance his journey away from the father's face. Covet earnestly the best gifts, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going after. I want the giver of the gifts. I don't want to wake up somewhere and, and have pursued blessing more than the blesser. And pursuit revival more than the reviver. There's somebody attached to all of this. And what we have been really wanting God to do for a long time is just slip his hands out from underneath the veil and dispense to us things from his hands so that we don't have to pay the price to go through the rent veil and approach his presence. And what he's looking for is somebody that wants to be more than his girlfriend and get the chocolates and the candies and the gifts. He's looking for a bride the last time I checked. That's high commitment. That's high hunger. That's saying, thank you. Thank you for what I felt last night. Thank you for what I felt yesterday. Thank you for what you've done at Brownsville. Thank you. But God, there's got to be more. That's why I'm saying, can somebody join with Moses and begin singing that song and say, God, I, I want to see your glory. And Moses heard the reply. The reply was, no man can see my face and live, but it didn't change the song. 
I still want to see your face. You mean you're willing to die and see my face? I don't care what it takes. I just want to see you. God's answer was to hide Moses in a cleft in the rock. And, and he said, now you stay there. And God reached forward, covered the mouth of the cave with his hand, ran past him and said, now Moses, when I pull my hand away, you stick your head out and look in the direction that I just passed by. How long does it take God to pass by? Milliseconds. How much revelation can you get in a millisecond? Moses stuck his head out and looked in the direction where God was disappearing. And King James poetically says he saw the hinder parts of God. I like to understand it as he saw the history, saw God's tracks. He saw where God had been. And in milliseconds, that's where he got the revelation that gave us the book of Genesis because he saw where God had been and what God had done and he could understand it. And all that did is fuel the passion for the present of God, the present presence of God. Probably if anybody in the world lives off of revival stories more than I do, it may be this man. I eat, sleep, live. I'm interested in that, but only for one reason. is not for what has happened, but it may give me a little bit of glimpse about what can happen and is going to happen. Let me tell you the difference between truth and revelation. Truth is where God has been. Revelation is where God is. You never throw away truth, but you always pursue revelation. Let me explain it to you like this. If, if, a, if we were in the jungle and you saw the track of a tiger, there are specialists who can examine the spore of a tiger. And they can tell you what gender it was. Is it male or female? And how heavy it was and how old it is and can, can derive all sorts of information about this tiger because they just looked at the track of the tiger. But I want to tell you, it's, it, there's a big difference in looking at the track of the tiger and staring into the eyes of the tiger. The tracks is where he has been. His eyes are where he is. And people find a truth of God and they camp on it. And then what they start doing is they, they've, they've discovered something about God and they know about him. And they, they'll, they'll pitch a protective tent over where God has been. And then they'll start inviting everybody and, and telling this is where God has been. This is this is this. This is that. This is the other. And if they're, if they're really arrogant, they will make the presumptive judgment call that their tra tiger track is the only tiger track in the jungle. Or it's the newest tiger track in the jungle. Hello? When the real purpose of that track is not to camp out around it, but to see which direction he was going and chase the tiger. Till you can see the tiger's eyes. I, I'm, I read the revival stories. I hear what they're saying. But I'm really only interested in one benefit. Where's God going? I want. You don't understand. We've seen what happens when God visits a church. You're looking at it. We have not yet, in my generation at least, we have not yet seen what happens when God visits a city. Where everything that happens in here, I'm going to tell you, I sit on the airplane and I dream a lot. I dream of overhearing. I run into people. About half the time I run into people in the airports, they're coming to Brownsville. And I dream of hearing something. I dream of hearing things like, where are you going? I'm going to the revival in 
name it, you know, Atlanta, Seattle, whatever the city. I'm going to the revival in Seattle. Really, what church? Oh, I hear it doesn't matter. That's what I'm after. What, what do you mean it doesn't matter? I mean, it doesn't matter. God is so broken over the city. It doesn't matter what church you go into. They're all in revival. I don't, know if you're, I don't know if your dreams are that big. I don't know if your expectations are that big. I'm happy for what God is doing, but you're looking at the hungriest human being on the earth. I am desperate. <laughs> I am desperate to see what God can do. So I hunt for the places where the heavens are weak and I pound the brass heavens and stick my fingers into the cracks of the windows trying to pry open the windows of heaven because somewhere it's going to happen if the glory of God is going to cover the earth like the water covers the sea. It's got to start somewhere. But the glory of God can't cover the earth if we can't even get it to flow down the aisles of the church. And if we're not careful... We will mistake anointing for glory. Anointing empowers flesh. Glory disables flesh. I thought they were the same. You know, I, we, we, I, I get in services and I cringe inside when I hear people say, the glory of God is here. Right. Maybe in my life, maybe three times, because when his glory shows up, re read about the dedication of Solomon's temple. When the glory of God shows up, there wasn't anybody running around, jumping up and down, saying, the glory of God is here. They were trying to dig holes in the floor, hide themselves. I, I don't know... Dr. Brown can fix all this after I'm gone because I'm just a little Cajun from Louisiana. <laughs> Anointing and glory are of the same substance. They're particles of God. But let me, let me describe it to you this way. On cool winter days, when there's not a lot of humidity in the air, you can scrape your feet across the carpet and touch the tip of somebody's nose and the tiniest blue spark of electricity will touch their nose and you can say, did you feel that? But let, let, let me strip the bare wires back on one of these extension cords here and let me touch you with that and see if you feel that. They're of the same substance. But one just makes you kind of feel good. Kids play games with it. They rub balloons on their heads and stick them on the wall. They do all kind of little parlor tricks with static electricity. But the other, you better be careful how you handle it. It'll either light up your life and heat your homes or it'll kill you. And the reason why you don't just turn a little kid loose, you don't care if they play with static electricity, but you, they, cover, they cover the outlets in homes with safety plugs because the immature don't know how to handle it. I wonder how long God has kept the real power sources of what we're after covered. While we're begging him, oh, we want more power, more power. He said, I, I would love to, but it'll kill you. You don't understand. You you're, not, you're not insulated. You see, in order to be insulated from electricity, you have to have an inert ingredient. And I'm not going to go into the chemical description of what inert is, but rubber is an inert ingredient. It can't pass through it, and then you can handle it. Actually, what I would try to describe that to you, it's something that's, that's dead. If you're ever going to 
touch the glory of God, you better be covered by something that's dead. Because when the priests were to enter in, they went in through blood. When they were dedicated, there was blood on their earlobes, blood on their thumbs, blood on their toes, as if to, 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 to circumference themselves with blood, to go in as if they were a dead man. Because the truth is, Moses, you're on to something. When God said, no man can see my face and live, what he's really saying is only dead men can see his face. And the New Testament form of death is repentance and you cannot call for the glory of God to come until you've learned how to handle the glory and the only way you handle the glory is dead men's hands if we're not careful what we do is we line people up and scrape our feet across the carpet of God's promises touch them on the head and say did you feel that well they shake a little bit what I'm talking about is a manifest presence of God coming that you don't have to ask anybody did they feel anything. There's no little quiverings and no shakings. It's like an atomic bomb gets dropped in the middle of everything. I'm rereading the Hebrides revival where he said, I heard it on the tape the other day, 70% of the people that got saved got saved before they ever came to church and only came to church to tell people what happened to them in the factories and in the fields and in their homes and wherever they were. That's not because somebody's preaching good and somebody's singing good. It's because somebody made an opening in the heavens and broke open the heavens and learned a little bit about the glory of God and the the glory of God began to come. And again, it lifted there because they didn't know how to handle it. You got to be a dead man. When David, I, I love 2 Samuel, I turned to it again, I read it sitting there. When David got ready to carry the ark to Jerusalem, you remember that passage there, they got it so far. And they were having real good services, really exciting, <laughs> lots of singing, and it was going okay till they hit a speed bump at Nacon's threshing floor. God will always put bumps in the road. If you're trying to get somewhere, he's going to put a bump in the road that's going to define, and he, he'll say, I've let you do things the way you wanted to this far, but from here on out, it's different. God will allow us to handle him the same way the world handles him up to a certain point. And in my opinion, that's where we are. We are at the bump in the road. God allowed David to handle the ark the same way the Philistines handled the ark. Put it on a cart and carried along, Ahio walks before, Uzzah walks behind. What we really like to do is make churches Uzzah friendly. I, I'm not against churches being user friendly. But what I really am for is getting churches spirit friendly. We know how to entertain man. Can I, can I tell you that? We, we have the entertainment of man down to a fine art. You pad the pews, you get the music right, you do this, you do all that. We know how to entertain man. But what I have, my question is, does anybody know how to entertain God? Because what is attractive to man and what's attractive to God are two different things. Man is repulsed by the smell of death and God is attracted to it. Because when he says they're putting death on, that means I can get close because I can only get as close as they are dead. Do you know Moses finally got his prayer answered? Let me, let me give you a, a quick lesson in the power of prayer. Moses prayed, show me your glory. Even after he was gone, that prayer bounced around the halls of heaven for 1,500 years until one day Jesus told his disciples, I can't take it anymore, come on, let's go. 
went on top of a mountain and the disciples prayed, or Jesus prayed and the disciples slept. Man always has an ability to fall asleep at, where, at juxtapositions of time and eternity. Our biggest danger is we miss things. You, you, you look in the wrong direction. You're, you're like the magician. You're, he distracts you over here while he does something. God's not intentionally trying to hide it from you, but he just wants to make sure you're serious. And so he begins to pray, and they go to sleep, and he prays until he prays the flesh away just about. And, and, and his, his garments became white and glistering. And if you study the original language there, it became like lightning bolts. He had on a, a lightning bolt sport jacket. And his glory was being revealed. While disciples were sleeping, it is an absolute amazement to me how you can have two, 3,000 people in a building and on the same bench, somebody be entranced by the glory of God. And somebody else saying, when will all this be over? just depends on your hunger level what you're after and he that's all he does is he, he leaves it like that Moses was called from heaven's repository stepped down and beheld the glory of God after his death because of a prayer he prayed before he died that's how long your prayers have effect with God when when we begin to pursue hard after the glory of God, you're going to understand something. He's going to teach you how to handle these things with care. Uzzah had been raised around the ark. Have you ever thought about this? How did they get the ark on the cart? Somebody had to pick it up that means that they had picked it up and handled it normally and it was not an uncommon thing but after the bump God says how you handled me now as opposed to how you used to handle me is different why because we're moving from anointing to glory and I'm going to dial things up and you better learn something now careful who's it put his hand out and lightning didn't come from the heavens. It came from between the outstretched wings of the cherubim. Smote him. Poetically, King James says it made a breach. It split him in two. And he's laying toasted over here on the ground. And suddenly, everybody is not quite, it's not, it's not quite like it was ten minutes ago. We were kind of happy and coasting through and very casual with it. You hear me, friend. There is an air of seriousness that is about to hit the church that is unprecedented. And it's time right now that we're at that bump. They didn't know what to do with the ark after that. They had to say, we got to be real careful with it. They took the ark. They took it to a man named Obed-Edom's house. I don't know how he got picked or how he got lucky, but can you imagine how they described to him, uh, Obed, we're leaving this ark at your house. How did they get it off of the cart? Shove it off, put it on. We don't really know. We're not, we don't tell. I can imagine them telling, Obed, I wouldn't let my kids play too close to that. I'd be real careful with it. And he says, oh, great, now I've got this. But something began to happen. Listen to me. And in the space of three months, everything in Obed-Edom's life was blessed. So much so that David heard about it, and David said, I knew it. If I can just get that ark to Jerusalem, just like it blessed the local area of Obed-Edom's house, if I can put the glory of God in Jerusalem, in the church, the whole nation will be blessed. We are at the point of localized blessing. That's why we have these outbreaks here and, and this Brownsville here and this there. But the next level of what God's doing, it won't just be localized blessing. He's going to revisit the entirety of his church with his glory. And when that happens, listen to me, friend. When that happens, do you know an interesting thing? 
After that, the next time you read about Obed-Edom, he is no longer living where he was. He's moved, and he's now a doorkeeper for the ark. It's as if he said, I found out something. It's wherever that glory is, that's where you need to be. Basically, what I came here tonight to tell you is there's a great shift going on. If what you want is bless me club church, you've missed the picture. It's supposed to be bless him church. It's supposed to be dead men with no agenda. Can you imagine after that and David says, okay, now we got to get the ark to Jerusalem. We have to do this, guys. We, we, we don't know how we have to reinstitute the Levitical priesthood. Where are the Levites? <laughs> Where are the men and the women who know how to put their hands to the holy things of God and live? Because they have insulated themselves with death to self. Can you imagine how the first Levites, they look at one another and they say, Is my ephod on straight? Is everything done right? Is it all set up the way it needs to be? Why? Because I'm about to touch this thing. I'm going to put the staves through there. And God is looking for sanctified shoulders. That's what these young people are all about. They're, they're, they're learning how to handle what God's getting ready to do. I feel the presence of God coming in this place. I want you to bow your head just a moment. I've got a lot of stuff left to tell you, but I sense something. <laughs> Those men that picked the ark up to carry it the rest of the way to Jerusalem... They were walking dead men. Can you see them as they kiss their wife goodbye? Kiss me, honey. Hug the kids. Why? Because I'm about to touch this, and the last guy that touched it, he didn't live. But I've done everything I know to do, and all I know is it's time to get the glory in the church. Where are the men and the women who will have the spirit of Esther? who say, if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to see the king. <laughs> Holy Spirit, right now, pierce the veil of our hearts. Deliver us from self-preservation. Turn us into pursuers of your purpose. Restore the Levitical order to the church. Bring about sanctified shoulders that know how. Oh, God, take the safety plugs off of the outlets of glory. Because, God, if we only do what we've already done, we're going to only get what we've already got. And it's not getting the job done. I don't want to appear ungrateful, God. I am so thankful for what you've done. I'm so thankful for bringing the ark to where it is. I'm thankful for Brownsville. I'm thankful. God, I'm thankful, but I am still so hungry. I know there's a place of your glory that we have not yet reached. If I can just get the ark... To Jerusalem, if we can just get glory in the church, then we'll have God in the city. Lord, we've begun to be addicted to anointing. We like to feel good. Just enough of you to make us tingle, but not enough to kill us. Somehow, Lord, I feel like there's men and women here and in the overflow room and 
maybe even listening by tape somewhere sometime, that something is clicking in them. You're saying right now, that man is saying what I've been thinking, that there's got to be more. Thank you for the blessing, but God, show me your glory. <laughs> We have sought your hands long enough, God. We shove your hands aside very graciously, but we go for your face. We don't want you just to dispense the gifts. We want the giver. Don't just bless us. <laughs> Remember, friends, somebody else may out-preach you. They may out-sing you. They may out-knowledge you. But it's only up to you. You determine your hunger level. If you're just hungry for a little touch, if you just want a little ripple on the waters, if you just want a little blessing at your church, you might ought to go on home right now because that's not what we're after and that's not all that God wants to give us. God has got his hand on the dial and he wants to dial his presence up to a manifest presence until the Shekinah glory of God hovers over the church and he restores the tabernacle of David and it's unveiled application of anybody can see the glory. But he's just looking for some dead men and some dead women who will apply themselves to carriers of the glory of God. Men and women who are dead to their own agendas. Men and women who don't care anymore. <laughs> Some of you have been intimidated. There are people here from all over the country and you say, I want revival in my church, but I don't have a, a musician like this, like this team and we don't have a Lyndall Cooley and we don't have a Michael Brown and we don't have a Steve Hill. You got your eyes on the wrong things. Nobody can out hunger you. Why don't you pick up the second verse of Moses' song and his prayer and say, God, show me your glory. Do you know how badly God is wanting to break out everywhere? <laughs> Do you know how frustrated God has to be when people take pilgrimages all over but they won't take a pilgrimage to the secret place to pursue his face the first step to becoming a dead man is something begins to break and what you're hearing right now is the beginning of the breaking of men's hearts because once it's broken only broken vessels can really carry the glory of God he never intended for it to be carried any other way remember the things that repel us attract God when services get like this, it makes people uneasy. It makes us a little uncomfortable. We get, well, what, what, what's going on around here? I'll tell you what's going on. I smell the singed hair burning and the sacrifice being laid on the altar. But it's attracting the presence of God because somebody is slipping on the rubber gloves of insulating death. And they're coating their earlobes and their thumbs and their toes with the blood of death. And they're saying, I know now only a dead man can get to where I'm going. Huh. 
You hear me, students? A live missionary is never going to get the job done, but a dead missionary is what God's looking for. You mean a literal dead man? No. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Just as those men that picked up the ark considered themselves dead because Uzzah had died, it's time that some of us counted everything as loss. For the pursuit of the manifest presence of God. I wish some of you would forget who's beside you and forget who's behind you and forget political decorum and forget church manners because I'm going to tell you, a hungry man doesn't eat with manners that befit a table of the king. He dives in. How hungry are you? How hungry are you? What do you want? You want Michael Brown's hand on your head or do you want God's hand on your heart? We have pursued the anointing long enough. It's time to pursue the glory. I'm not against anointing. <laughs> but I want to tell you, there's another level coming. <sighs> Father, I stir up the hunger. I breathe on the embers of frustration right now. Let it become a holy frustration, a seething desire that nothing else can satisfy. We have satisfied ourselves with careers. We have satisfied ourselves with nice services, with ooze of friendly things. But I feel a bump in the road, and that bump is when the glory begins to revisit the ark. And how we've done things is not going to be how we do things. We can't keep doing things like we've done them. If God is going to take the safety covers off of the outlets of his glory, somebody's going to have to demonstrate a higher level of maturity. I read it somewhere, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When are we going to set aside our agendas to institute his agenda? Listen to me. Just close your eyes and dream with me for a minute. Michael, come help me. Just dream with me for a minute. I dream of the day when some someday in the future. <laughs> We look back on these past two years, three years, and we talk about how great it was, and then we say, but that was before the revival really started. Mm. Be Jesus. Be Jesus. 
That's when we were just learning how to handle the glory. That's when it was still contained and confined inside the church. That was before it broke out into the community. I'm so hungry for that. I hear the voice from heaven saying, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm just looking for a place to reveal my glory. I'm looking for a place to pull the covers off the outlets. I'm looking. But I got to find some dead men and some dead women. Because if you're already dead, it can't kill you. He who seeks to save his life will lose it, and he who doesn't care about his life will redeem it. We need to repent for seeking revival more than the reviver. Revival brings anointing. Reviver brings glory. It's not that it's sin, it's just there's a higher level. Something's coming, friend. It's going to be so big until no single man will ever be attached to it. It's the difference between a river and an ocean. There's a lot of streams. There's Baptist streams and Assembly of God streams and charismatic streams, but they all should wind up in the ocean. Can I tell you, wherever you're from and wherever you're going, God is wanting to break out. Somebody needs to knock on heaven's door. Somebody needs to thrust their hands into the heavens. And it's almost like you see a crack in the heavenlies and if we can get our fingers in that crack in the window and by whatever we have we begin to pry open the windows of heaven so the glory of God can begin to stream down and first it fills the church and then it flows out over the threshold of the church and interestingly enough it was shallowest at the church and it got deeper as it went Somebody needs to pray with Moses. Show me your glory. Lord, we turn our back on rest. We don't care if you go with us because we're only going with you. We don't know where we're going. We're with you. Show us your glory. I don't know about you, but I want an encounter with God that I can't get over. I'm tired of temporary things. I'm tired of, that was good for yesterday, but I, I, I want something that I can't get over. I want something that makes me pile up stones and say, I'll never be the same. I want an outbreak of God's glory that transforms me. I challenge you right now. Put your hand on your heart and say, God, let something happen to me that I cannot get over. Let this be another milestone in my journey. I'm telling you, some of you are inches away from the encounter of a lifetime. But how long are you going to dance around in front of the veil without going through the veil? You are so close. 
to having something happen in you that you'll never be the same. A Damascus road. You need to repent, put the blood on you, and go through the veil. I challenge you right now, forget who's around you. Forget what protocol is. Forget what manners are. Forget what. Why don't you just get so desperate? Why don't you act like a starving man? A starving woman. Pass the outer court. sick of ourselves we're sick of dancing around in front of the veil we're sick of calling the holy place the holy of holies take us through what about it in the balcony are you hungry remember it's your hunger that will determine how deep calls to deep it's not how good you preach. It's not how good you sing. It's how hungry are you? line 